Hey, Jason here. And very quickly, I wanna talk about really the simplest way anybody who's looking to get into mergers and acquisitions, into the process of founding a investment group that buys businesses, I wanna talk about the simplest way to get to where you're trying to go. And really, in my estimation, for 95% of you watching, where you're trying to go is you're trying to buy a company. You're trying to buy a proper company that's going to pay you each month after you close the deal. That's what you're trying to do, ultimately. Now, there's a lot of things we could talk about. We could talk about making sure you buy companies that do seven figures a year in sales because anything less than that is not gonna have enough meat on the bone for you to get yourself out of the day-to-day -day operations. We could talk about building a great team alongside you, which I deem to include an accountant, a lawyer, and an industry expert. I'm not talking about third-party firms. I'm talking about individuals who fulfill those three roles. Again, accountant, lawyer, industry expert. Okay, we could of course talk about the importance of the sector you get involved in, the importance of the sector you get involved in cannot be understated. Those are all very relevant items, but none of them are what I wanted to talk to you about in this video. What I wanted to talk to you about in this video is the power of making offers. The power of making offers. One of the biggest areas, if not the biggest area that I see people dropping the ball on is they are afraid to make offers. And I think the reason they're afraid to make offers is because they realize that once you make an offer, it may re be rejected, and even scarier, if it's accepted, now you have to raise the finance and the money to close the deal. Making offers is scary. Making offers is like asking out that woman or that man that you really like without any promise whatsoever of what will happen next. Yet making offers is precisely what most of you need to do if you're serious about getting into this game. And by getting into this game, I don't mean just trying, I mean closing a deal or two and really having businesses that you own or at least that you own the majority of the shares of. Now, again, I'm not gonna talk in this video about how to finance deals and how to close the deal and how to operate the deal post-close. We've made a ton of videos on the channel about those different items and you can subscribe to the YouTube channel, which I recommend you do. In this video, I just wanna talk a little bit more about making offers. And really, the punchline is, is if you're making offers at three times historical earnings, you're probably gonna be pretty good. You're probably going to be pretty good. As long as the year-to-date numbers are holding, if not improving, based on historical performance, you can look at the trailing three-year tax returns you can take line 21 on the tax return. That's the net income the business produced. You can take line 21, add interest, add taxes, add amortization, add the owner's salary, add any extra add backs like meals, and then subtract 50,000 from that because you're gonna wanna pay yourself at least a $50,000 basis for a salary per year. And then multiply that number by three and do that for 2018, 2019, and 2020, for example. So do it for the trailing three years. And that right there is basically the number you're gonna offer for the business. So let's say that, let, let's do that one more time. I don't want there to be any, any misunderstanding here, okay? You take line 21 on the tax returns. That's the net income the business showed on their federal tax returns. You then add interest. I think it's gonna be like line 17 or line 18. You add taxes. It's gonna be right around there near interest. You add amortization. That's amortization of any loans that the business is paying off. You add the owner's compensation. I think that's around line 10 or line 11. That's how much the owner paid him or herself, herself a year. You go down to schedule two where you're gonna see meals. That's about three or four pages below this initial front page of the tax return to see if the, the individual wrote off meals and things like that through the business. And you take that number, you take all those numbers, you add them up you then subtract 50,000 from that number because you're still gonna have to pay yourself a base, say 50,000 a year. Most banks are gonna expect you're gonna pay yourself about 50,000 a year to run the business. And that's your number. That's how much the business earned in a given year. I call that EBITDA plus extra owner ad backs. Earnings before interest, taxes. I don't include depreciation, so I wipe that off. But amortization, EBIT, ah, E B I T, earnings before interest, taxes, amortization, and, and basically then other ad backs like meals. You then also include the owner's salary. How much did the owner pay himself? Add that in as well. Earnings before interest, taxes, amortization, owner salary, meals. Add all those up and then subtract that number by 50,000, that's how much the business earned in a given year. Take that number and then do that same exact formula for the trailing three years. So if you did that for 2020, also do that for 2019, also do that for 2018. 
same thing. Earnings before interest, taxes, amortization, meals, and then owner salary minus 50,000. Okay, so do that for say 2018, 2019, 2020, add all three of those numbers up, add 2018 plus 2019 plus 2020, and then divide it by three. You're basically getting the average of those three years. As long as those earnings are pretty stable and they're not too volatile, or if anything, as long as they're going up year after year, you have a pretty interesting business. You can pay three times normalized earnings all day long. On a 10 year amortizing loan, you can do that all, all day long. On a fully amortizing 10 year note, you can pay off three times earnings all day long, as long as you don't come in and absolutely wreck the business. And so really in a nutshell, making offers is pretty simple. Now we could talk about stock purchases versus asset purchases. Generally, I'd recommend you, you make asset purchases. Why? Well, notably because asset purchases leave any liabilities at the door. Liabilities, by liabilities, I notably mean lawsuits. Okay, if you buy the legal entity, you're also acquiring its liabilities. Whereas if you just buy the assets of the business, now you're really gonna leave any of those legal liabilities at the door. And you don't wanna acquire any unnecessary risk. Business is all about maximizing, maximizing upside while minimizing downside. The one exception where you would be interested in making a stock purchase is if the business has this, I mean, I'm sure there's other exceptions, but this is the obvious one. If a business has a bunch of great contracts, say five or 10 year contracts, say for example, to do business with a municipality or a government or a state or a big corporation. And those contracts are a fundamental piece of the value proposition from which the business you're buying has. In that case, okay, buy the, the stock, the shares of the business, do a, a stock purchase agreement. But generally speaking, you'd prefer to make an asset purchase. And here's the beautiful thing. If you built a team like I recommend you do here, a lawyer, an accountant, an industry expert, your lawyer is going to help you with all this. Your lawyer, if it's an M&A lawyer who's been around the block for a decade or two or more, this person knows all about this stuff, way more than I do. I'm not a practicing lawyer. I just happen to talk to my business partner who happens to be a lawyer for oftentimes two, three, four hours a day. And I've been doing that for the last two years. So eventually you learn a lot about the legal process of buying companies. But in any event, the name of the game is making offers. You're never gonna get into this game if you don't make offers. And again, making offers is scary because once you make an offer, it may get accepted. And then if it gets accepted, you're gonna have to raise seven figures or eight figures worth of debt and equity. Good news is I talk about how to do this here on the YouTube channel all the freaking time. And ultimately, you have to be willing to fail to succeed in business. The story of the guy who founded KFC is a classic example. The Colonel, Colonel Sanders. That individual wasn't, I believe, 60 or 65 years old until he really hit it big with Kentucky Fried Chicken. Up until that point, he had failed and failed and failed and failed and failed. Maybe you've seen the movie, The Founder that chronicles the rise of McDonald's. It's a great film to watch. I recommend you rent it sometime on Netflix or go down to your local Blockbuster if you still have one in the local neighborhood. Okay, and by the way, the story of Blockbuster is an example of what happens when you buy a business in a dying sector. Okay, so that's why it's so important to buy businesses in a thriving sector. If you bought a whole bunch of movie rental stores about 10 years ago, you're struggling right now, obviously. Okay, but if you look at the story of the, the Colonel, Mr. Kentucky Fried Chicken, or if you watch the founder in the rise of McDonald's, or if you study the, the upcoming of, of Jeff Bezos and Amazon, you'll see that in many, if not most of these cases, these were individuals that failed their way to success, that were doubted every step of the way. They just kept swinging and swinging and swinging and swinging and swinging, and that's what made them who they are today, as far as their results the tangible results you see in all the net worth they've created for themselves, their family, their loved ones, and yada, yada, yada. Buying companies is not easy, but it's not rocket science either. You know, really, I would say it's simple, but not easy. The process is fairly simple. I've pretty well laid out the process here on YouTube. You can go to jasonpaulrogers.com backslash free training for more, but really the process is fairly simple. Build a pick a great sector, build a team, call companies in your local area to look to buy them. Ring, ring, ring. Hey there, Mr. Jones, are you interested in selling? Do that a thousand times. Expect to get rejected 90 to 95% of the time. 
But if you have 5% success rate and you make 100 calls a day, you're gonna add five new deals or at least five new leads to your pipeline a day. Once you get a bunch of those business owners that are thinking about selling, request their trailing three-year tax returns and their P&Ls and their balance sheets. Simultaneously start calling on banks, telling the banks you built a team, you're making acquisitions in XYZ sector. This is a great sector because of ABC reason. We're looking at this deal. We're looking at that deal. We're looking at that deal. Would you be interested in lending on a potential acquisition opportunity that we bring to you in the coming months? Find some banks that are keen to lend in your sector. Then finally, once you make an offer for a company that you like and get it accepted, you take that deal to a bank, you look to get it financed, you close the deal, and then the fun begins. You get to operate the damn thing. I mean, yes, there's a little bit more to it than just that, but in a nutshell, that's the process. Most people are able to build a team. Most people are able to build, you know, pick the sector. Most people are able to pick up the phone and place calls to off-market deals. But around that point is usually when most people stop. They don't make offers. They don't request the tax returns. They don't request the financials. They, they, they build the team. They get the battleship in the right position, but then they don't, pull, they don't pull the trigger and fire the missile, if you will. You gotta fire the missile. You gotta shoot your shot. You gotta get skin in the game. You gotta swing at the plate. You gotta make offers. And that's how you make offers. Now look, you can, we can talk about deal structuring real quickly. Like, oh, right, okay, you so, you can offer a seller, say, 75% cash, 25% seller finance. That's a pretty good structure for many of you who are getting into the game. You're going to give them 75% of the purchase price up front, and then the final 25% is going to be on a seller second note, a seller finance note. If it's a real estate property, I recommend offering a first position seller finance note and giving the guy 25% down, basically allowing the seller to be the bank. It's a lot easier to get a first position seller finance note when the guy has a hard asset like a piece of property than it is when the guy has a business. If the guy's willing to finance the majority of the purchase price for a business, be skeptical of that business. But really with the SBA in particular, and I've talked about here on YouTube, the 95-5 deal structure for the SBA, I would recommend you search that video here on YouTube. But if you use the 95-5 deal structure for the SBA, you can get a deal done right now, no problem. Because as of 2021, there's new legislation where the SBA guarantee has gone from 75% all the way up to 90%. I believe I made a video about that as well here in 2021 on the YouTube channel. So there's a lot of ways to get deals done. And you're going to learn more about how to get deals done as you make offers. But really, with the SBA right now, if you offer the seller between 75 to 90% of the purchase price in cash, and you offer the seller three times earnings, you can get the deal done. And then when I say cash, that just means you have to move the money at the closing day. It doesn't mean you have to have liquidity right then and there yourself. It means you're gonna go raise it from say an SBA lender or a commercial lender or even a private lender. And if that business has strong trailing through your tax returns, you're gonna be able to get the deal financed as long as you put together a quality team. And as long as you speak about business fairly articulately. So the name of the game is getting out there and making offers. Well, first of all, it's picking up the phone, calling on, on deals, you know, calling every single bit business in your local area in the specific sector that you're targeting and asking to speak to the owner. And once you do say, hey, I'd like to buy your business. Are you keen to sell? Do that a thousand times, you're gonna find some deals. And then once you find some sellers or some potential sellers, hey, I need you trailing through your tax returns. Of the people you talk to that are potentially willing to sell, only some of them are gonna send you your tax returns. Some of them will fall off, but others will give you their tax returns. At that point, you analyze your tax return, those tax returns exactly the way I talked about earlier in this video. And for those tax, those businesses that have strong tax returns, you make offers. You offer them 75, 80, 85, maybe 90% of the purchase price at closing, and they're gonna hold a bit of seller note on the back end. I recommend you keep 5% of the seller note on hold for the life of the first position note. That'll help you get an SBA loan for if you're, if you're in the United States. I believe I talked about that again in that 95-5-5-5 SBA deal structure video that I talked about about six or eight months ago here on the YouTube channel. So I've given you a lot of the content here for free. Of course, if you want more information, go to jasonpaulrogers.com, but the name of the game is pulling the trigger. Most of this is not that complicated. It just requires an action taker, and hopefully that's you. With that, if you've liked this video, thumbs it up, subscribe to the YouTube channel for more, Share your comments below. What do you think? What would you like me to talk about next? I'm here to help. Let me know. Go to jasonpaulrogers.com for more, and I'll talk to you in the next video.